what if it were today? That is the question. 153. folks know the song so for those of you that do know it sing really loud for the rest of us <laughs> so if I if I sing wrong notes don't pay attention to me I'll lead everybody astray so <laughs> let's go ahead and sing it on the second verse and then just disregard the holds we'll just go right go right through them so second verse ready Satan's dominion will then be heard what if it were It's a good song. It's a good song. I just don't know it very well. Alrighty. Anyone have any requests this afternoon? Go ahead, uh, Luke, in the back. 494. Okay. 494. Don't want to do this. We've sung this one a lot recently. Do you have Elder Luke in the back? It was the same thing? Okay. <laughs> Who is next on the list? Go ahead. At Calvary. At Calvary. That's a good one. What's the number for that? 477. At Calvary. 477. I've been in some places where like we've gotten requests and we've gotten the same requests at times four or five weeks in a row. And it's they're great songs, but then by the fourth time that week's like, oh man, 
I love this song, don't want to wear it out, so we'll save it for some other time. 477. Number 34. Do I know it? Yes. I do. And we'll sing one more after this one. Number 34. Slow it down a little bit. 
It's a little bit quick. Let's slow it down. Ready? Start again. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know. announcements um, pretty much the same thing as this morning first of all baby shower for Miss Rhea and Mordecai is coming up this Wednesday the 16th at 2 p.m. right here at the church so be ready for that Wednesday the 16th at 2 p.m. I'm assuming that's ladies only so <laughs> plan on that ladies only camp um, summer camp coming up we have more details on that soon but just so that that's kind of on everybody's mind camp is coming up and there will be more announcements to follow all right if you haven't been here in the morning i'm just going to clue you in real quick in case you're staring at this coloring page uh this is your salvation the faith of jesus christ and then peter said in first peter i'm sorry second peter chapter one apostle peter said add to your faith virtue and then he said add to virtue knowledge if you've ever met somebody that's so full of knowledge, you can't even hardly get along with them because they are so full of facts and so full of dictionary encyclopedia facts that they don't know when to keep their mouth shut. It's probably because they never added virtue to their building structure in the Christian life. So Jesus Christ is your foundation of faith. Add to that virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity. It's taking us a little while to build this wall. I was going to preach it all in one Sunday. And we haven't got through it yet in two Sundays, so stay tuned. Maybe we'll build the wall next Sunday. Um, but, I mean, isn't that how it is? You don't get to build the whole Christian life in a Sunday. I get one hour to undo 167 hours of your week. Amen. Right? <laughs> oh, it ain't going to get built in an hour. All right, let's do some question and answers tonight. Uh, let's turn to the first one. As soon as I find my cards, I'm not sure what order I ended up in. give you a reference here. Um, save that for last. Uh, second. Okay. Let's turn to Romans 1. Romans 1. Romans 1. I love these questions. Um, 
because if one person has the question, there's 10 other people thinking it that probably weren't going to write it down, but they have had that question as well. Oh, one more announcement. Over on the table are some booklets. If you're interested, take a booklet. Um, I forgot to announce these on Wednesday night, but this is a prayer book, prayer diary, and in the front it has a list for missionaries, and then all through the book is just the same page over and over of prayer requests, uh, checkbox on the right if they're saved or lost, a date if you want to use that, but very simple, basic, just the basics for taking prayer requests. If you want to take that and then have the, the same things from last week, and you can... Um, Remember to pray for those during the week. Um, those, there's about 20 of them on the table, so feel free to take one if you would like one. Okay, Romans 1, here's the question. Um, is it okay for a gay person to quote me scripture and be a member of church? All right, so this is a friend of a friend asking this question here. A friend of somebody here in church, but we're going to seek to answer that from the scriptures tonight. Lord, I ask you please bless this lesson now. I ask you bless the words that we're looking at in scripture. Uh, Lord, I know when a lot of people turn to the Bible, their mind kind of goes foggy and blank and they don't see what they're reading and I've experienced it many times with uh, trying to show somebody what the Scripture says. Lord, I ask that you would open our eyes and our understanding and enlighten us. I ask that you shine some light on the Scripture. I ask that you, the Holy Spirit, would be our teacher tonight and I ask that you please help me to be a good vessel to minister these words. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so the question is about gay people. So number one, I have a correction, and this is not a uh, hard, fast rule thing that has to stick forever, but uh, I do not call homosexuals gay people. So that's the question, and that's fine. It's not a big deal. Um, but what did gay mean in our dictionary 50 years ago? Yeah. It meant happy. We find it in some of our songs. Uh, and what do you find as a group, as a whole, statistically, what do you find in the group of uh, the homosexual community as far as their depression rates. Has anybody ever looked this up? Mm -hmm. You might want to check it out sometimes or ask somebody in the know. Yep, the depression rates are far higher, far, far, far higher, I didn't print all the statistics out today, uh, than uh, let's say just the whole or the statistical average of heterosexual people. So uh, they are not gay or happy, but isn't that what you do? You put a title on a thing to make it what it isn't? Isn't that what you do? You got a soap that doesn't work very well, and so you call it, oh, what do they call these soaps? What's that worst one that I can't stand? Yeah, palm olive is a good one. Anyways, when you get into the company's advertisements, oh, that's not, there's one that's not coming to my mind. They had a commercial about, about how clean it leaves you feeling, and every time my mom got that soap, it was the only one that didn't rinse off. Yeah, Zest. Yeah, Zest Fully Clean. That's the one. Zest Fully Clean. I can still sing the commercial. It's the one that leaves the most slimy, soapy residue on you. Don't buy Zest. Get something else. Uh, uh, anyhow, thank you for saving the illustration. Uh, what do you call yourself when you're the most depressed group of people living in the country? You call yourselves happy. You use the title gay. Uh, what do you use when you've defiled everything that God said in Scripture and you've gone against everything that God said was righteous? You go to God in your perversion and you pick a symbol, a rainbow, and you say, we're going to take God's promise not to destroy a righteous man, right, in an ark, while he destroyed everybody else. We're going to take that symbol and apply it to ourselves so that God, we have protection from God because God loves everybody, especially us perverts. Okay, so is it okay for a gay person to quote scripture? Well, you can quote whatever you want. But interpret scripture? I do not allow sex perverts to interpret my Bible. Amen. Turn to Romans 1. Turn to Romans 1. Romans 1, you say, well, that's just Old Testament law, and a lobster is abomination in the Old Testament, too. Oh, well, okay. Let's see if it's confirmed in the New Testament, because lobster is not an abomination in the New Testament. Neither is wearing linen and, and uh, garment mixed with a woolen garment. Somehow you don't find that in the New Testament. What do you find in the New Testament? You find a confirmation of those laws that God said, I want to continue. How would you know that? By reading your New Testament. Romans 1. I'm going to start in the middle here, very end of the chapter, verse 28. And then we're going to back up two verses in a moment. But let's just start with me in 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge... That they refers all the way back to the people in verse 18 who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Somebody holds the truth, that means they have it, 
and they hold it in a perverted way. They apply it the way they want to apply it, and they hold it, the right thing, in unrighteousness, the wrong thing. So that's the they in verse 28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Of course they didn't. God gave them over to a reprobate mind. It affects your mind. It affects your thinking. To do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with. Now you may have problems with sin in your life. And this some of the sins on this list may be in your life. But woe unto the person who is filled with these things. I mean we've all known a Christian who had trouble with uncleanness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness. I mean, we were joking about today. Brother Brent was here, pastor in Helena. He said, I was coveting your office, right? <laughs> okay, we're joking about that. Is he filled with covetousness? Okay, so this is the distinction here. Filled with these things. Fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity. That, that's anger, just like the maliciousness, intention of anger towards other people. Malignity, very similar word. Whispers, backbiters. Haters of God, despiteful, proud, gay what? Filled, filled with it. Proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Well, there's some of the beginnings of it. Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. 32, what do we know about these people who, knowing the judgment of God... Do you know the assumption I walk into any conversation with? Anybody who is a perverted, sexual, sodomite? You know what I know about them? I know what the scripture says about them. They know the judgment of God. Yes, they, do. they know the judgment of God. That they which commit such things are worthy of death. They know that it's not a lifestyle, it's a death style. They are worthy of death. Not only... Do the same, so these people do the same, including everything on this list. We're not, this passage isn't only about homosexuals. But not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So if you want to meet them, go to the Patagonia store in Dillon. Mm, birds of a feather are somehow flying together. Yes, I have something that has Patagonia on it somewhere in my closet, yes. And I also eat Cheerios from time to time, right? And I also shop at Walmart, right? Say, I'm going to boycott those. I'm going to write them a letter. We should get a... And you're not going to purchase oil either? Like you're not going to put gas in your car? Because you know what they support. Where do you draw the line? Well, here's where you draw the line. I don't have pleasure in them that do them. Those aren't my buddies. Okay, now let's back up and get this very clear here. There's no missing it. There's no glazing your eyes over and acting like it's not there. It's there. Verse 26. For this cause... God gave them up unto vile affections. It went so far that God stopped dealing with them. He gave them up and gave them over to it. Gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Let me ask you, were they doing that before or after God gave them up? Nope. Read it again. For this cause, verse 26. Gave them up because of it. I showed that to somebody on the street one time. They said, see, I'm this way because God made me this way. <laughs> I thought you missed it again. Don't allow sex perverts to interpret your scriptures. We've got all adults here in case you're wondering online. This is adult classroom, Sunday school afternoon. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Nature teaches you some things. Over in 1 Corinthians, you find out about the hair and other things. Verse 27, and likewise also... The men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. So sodomites burn in their lust. God burned Sodom and Gomorrah. What do you do to the frayed end of a rope? I burn mine so they don't unravel. What's the frayed end of a rope look like at the end of a cigarette while it's burning? You ever see that? You know the Brits call their cigarettes fags? Do you know why they call them that? Because the end of it, while you're smoking it, looks like the frayed end of a rope. And the frayed end of a rope is called a fag. What do you do to that? What do you do to it? You do what God did to Sodom and Gomorrah to it. Do you know what a bundle of sticks was called in Fox's Book of Martyrs when they set the bundle of sticks before the people that they were burning at the stake? It's over and over in Fox's Book of Martyrs. Why would you call somebody that? Because burning is a part of their existence. 
Where do they go when they die? Well, if they're not saved, they go to hell and they burn. Where does it start? Their lusts. Leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust, one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly. I love the Bible words, unseemly. It doesn't make you feel dirty reading it. It makes you feel like justice is being written. <laughs> and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. What's the recompense of their error? Um, well, you won't find this online. It's kind of hard to trace it down, but you can verify it if you want. We call it AIDS today, somehow associated with HIV. But when it came out and was first studied, and just they put it in the lab and look under a microscope and put a label on it. This disease that we know as AIDS today was originally called GRID. How many of you knew that? How many of you know what it stands for? Nobody. It was called GRID. G-R-I-D. Gay Related Immunity Deficiency. Where did they find it? They found it in a certain group of people who received in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat, which was fitting. So it's fitting. You know, the preachers knew that it was fitting. Give me one moment to find a quote here. I didn't plan to read. Preachers knew it was fitting, and many of the preachers preached against it. And the preachers quit preaching against it because it started coming to their church, and then they decided, well, are we going to preach against this and offend somebody? Say, I'm a little uncomfortable with you talking about this because I have a family member who's gay. Number one, you have a family member who's a sodomite, right? Because you took the scriptural position before your family member had that problem? Number two, who doesn't have that family member? I do. Who doesn't have that family member? And here's the question that you're going to have quest asked you all your life. Are you going to side with God? Or are you going to side with the cultural feelings and the, the, the acceptable thing today? Amen. September 26, 1993. This is back when AIDS was really getting uh, talked about a lot in the media. I remember hearing about it as a, as a child. September 26, 1993. Billy Graham, is AIDS a judgment from God? What was his answer? I cannot say for sure, but I think so. That's a very good answer in 93 when nobody knew what AIDS was and how it all shook out and all that. I cannot say for sure, but I think so. That was on September 26th. On October 10th, month and a half? No, less than, no, two weeks later. October 10th. He said this, To say God has judged people with AIDS would be very wrong. I would like to say that I am very sorry for what I said. You say, Isaac, what do you think about Billy Graham? I think he's compromised his entire life, and I have pages of it in here, because he's been asked about so many times as me being a pastor. What did he do? He did what was socially and culturally acceptable in that political position of that topic. Well, didn't we decide a long, long time ago that this was our authority? We can show it in the Old Testament when Sodom flickered, or we can show it in the New Testament when God said men with men, unseemly, just recompense, error, pleasure in them that do them, judgment of God. We can find it in either testament. You say, what should we do about that? Let me give you some application on this. Number one, what should we not do? We should not go out and pick it with signs that say God hates fags. We should not do that. You say, who would do that? Oh, good night. Look online. Find out who would do that. Idiots would do that. You say, why would they do that? Because they're not doing what the Lord asked them to do. Because the Lord had something for them to do, and, and it wasn't that, and they didn't want to do it, so they did that and made a national scene out of the thing. And now when I street preach on the corner, I'm associated with that fool. Christian fool, presumably, <coughs> presumably saved. The question was, is it okay for a gay person to quote me scripture and be a member of a church, member of church? Well, the church is the body of Christ, right? So can, the, can that person be saved? Can a Christian commit any sin in the book? Yes, he can. Can his spirit sin? No. no. We're covering that on Wednesday nights. It's very clear. So what's going on there? You have somebody inside. You have the Christian, the saved man, the Holy Spirit inside that's directly contrary to everything going on on the outside. Well, that's, that's pretty common, as wicked as it is. So can he be saved? Can he be a member of a church in good standing, like a local body of believers? I should hope not. I should hope not. 
and, and obviously not here, right? But I should hope not in the general question. So here's what I want to say. Those people are sinning, right? And the next thought is, well, aren't we all sinners? How many of you are sinners? Sure you want to raise your hand? We're talking about homosexuals. <laughs> <laughs> For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? We're all sinners. What's this guy doing? He is continuing in sin without repentance. You know what I'll allow in this church? If I have any say in it, I'll allow people who are sinners. Because the Lord allows them. The Lord allows people who have sin in their nature, but he will not tolerate a man who regards sin in his heart and won't give it up and won't repent of it. You say, what about your, your brother, your sister, your cousin, your uncle, your nephew that you found out? What about that? He's a sinner, for all have sinned. He might be saved and he might not, and it's not based on this. You know what that is? That's sin that needs repented of. Is he a Christian? Oh, come on. Obviously, he's not a Christian. A Christian means Christ-like. Saved means going to heaven and not going to hell. Christian means I'm trying to be like Christ. And disciple might be one step beyond that if they're not synonymous. Disciple is a disciplined person who's following Christ. And lastly, there's a place of repentance. You know, the worst person in the Bible may be Jezebel, that wicked prophetess in the Old Testament. The Lord says in the end of the book in Revelation, He says, I've given her space to repent of the same thing, immorality, fornication. I've given her space to repent. God allows repentance for anybody. Now, if that person shows up and repents, forgive them. But that doesn't mean you have to trust them the next day. They haven't earned your trust just because you've forgiven them. And the Lord isn't going to put them in some position that's compromising to them uh, because of their temptation or because of their sin. And the same with anybody else and any other sin. All right, there's uh, some thoughts on that. And I'm pretty sure I said more in 15 or 20 minutes than I could hear in an hour of the modern mega churches when they talk about God made them male and female. Make me gag. Why don't you just give us Romans 1. If you want to preach an hour on it, give us some Old Testament stuff on God's character and God's nature, and you'll have more in 15 minutes than you will in an hour and a half. Okay, I don't need to spend the whole time on that. We don't have that problem here in church, but that is a problem in our culture for sure. It's getting worse by the day. Okay, that's, that's our attitude towards it. Uh, turn to Romans 11. Romans 11. Romans 11. If we are graft into the family of God, and they also said adopted, so that's Romans 11 and Romans 8. We'll, we'll take a minute in Romans 11. If we are graft or adopted into the family of God, why don't we celebrate the holy days? Okay, that's a legitimate question. Why don't we celebrate the Old Testament feasts and holy days? Look at Romans 11. Romans 11, and look at verse uh, 21. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, that's the nation of Israel, but toward thee goodness, that's you in the, uh, in the body of Jesus Christ, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. When are the Gentiles that were added to the body of Christ, when are the Gentiles going to be cut off? After the rapture. After the rapture. So there's this tree that's been growing. We don't have time to expound the whole passage, but if you want to read it, there's a tree of the nation of Israel, and that tree had a branch growing out of it that was Abraham and his lineage, and that branch got broken off. It's no longer connected to the tree of life just because you're an Israelite serving the Old Testament commandments and the Old Testament uh, ceremonial laws or the feasts or the sacrifices. So I can answer this question real quickly. The reason we don't celebrate the Holy Days is the same reason we don't celebrate, we don't have a sacrifice here on Sunday morning, right? We don't bring sheeps and goats in here and make a bloody mess every morning and burn their, their flesh and hide and dung and all the different things. Why? Because those things were for a branch, the nation of Israel, and we have replaced them, and our branch is different. We have different requirements. In verse 23, 
And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grafted in. So that tree has been laying there, that branch of Israel has been broken off and laying in the ground for 2,000 years now, or on God's calendar for two days, right? So if a day is 1,000 years and 1,000 years is one day, they've been laying in the ground for about two days. You think a branch could be grafted in after two days? I suppose. I suppose God could pick it up, make a little scion, and put it all to back together with the way that they do that. They shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. 24, if thou wert cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So that's the grafting. And one day Israel will be grafted back into its own tree. Turn to Colossians 2. Why don't we keep these feasts? Because Paul told us not to keep these feasts. Look at Colossians 2. Colossians 2. Colossians 2 and look at verse 11. Nope, that was Wednesday night. Colossians 2 and look at verse uh, 14. Colossians 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. That's the Old Testament law. So Colossians 2.14 has a handwriting of, what's the next word? Colossians 2.14, blotting out the handwriting of what? Ordinances. Ordinances. That sounds like a bunch of legal things. That sounds like a bunch of laws that a judge would refer to and make a decision. Well, God took that thing and blotted it out. That means he took a bunch of ink and dumped it on there, or a bunch of water and erased the ink, which was contrary to us. Boy, it sure was contrary to us. You ever try keeping the law? One of us has. <laughs> it's contrary. And took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Where is the law today? It's crucified right next to Jesus Christ on the same cross. It's hanging there. It's not in uh, um, application to somebody who has met Jesus at the cross. 15, and having spoiled principalities and powers, that's the spiritual things going on there. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Verse 16, let no man therefore judge you in meat. That means food. That's anything you eat. Let no man therefore judge you in, in meat. Now, we're talking about in a spiritual thing here, right? If, if you eat um, Pop-Tarts, I'm going to judge you, okay? Right? If you eat Twinkies, I'm judging you. Yes, all of us are, yes. But that's not the context. The context is for a spiritual, um, for a spiritual reason for your spirituality. Let no man therefore judge you in meat because you think it's right or wrong to eat a certain meat. Or in drink. You say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep the Old Testament law and I'm not going to eat shellfish. and I'm not going to eat scallops and prawns and shrimp and, and pork. Well, I am not going to sit at the table and laugh at you and make fun of you because you picked the pepperoni off your pizza, which I have been there and seen other Christians do. I'm not against you. I'm not going to make a judgment about that for your spirituality. Maybe that guy's reading the Old Testament hasn't gotten to the New Testament yet, and he's actually doing what no other American does because they, all they do is watch TV. Maybe that guy's trying to be spiritual, and I'm not going to judge him for that. Or in drink, or in respect, in respect regarding this thing, and Holy Day. Why don't we celebrate the Holy Days? Well, number one, you are not allowed to judge me whether I keep a Holy Day or don't keep a Holy Day. That kind of lessens their importance, doesn't it? If you want to keep the Feast of Tabernacles and give gifts around Christmas type of stuff during September, I, I kind of appreciate it. If you're going to be that kind of guy that goes against the grain and says, I'm going to have Christmas when I think Jesus was born on this earth because I really care about the gifts because the wise men brought gifts. We have a scriptural example of it. And Jesus was most likely born on the Feast of Tabernacles, so much so there's proof in Scripture that he was in a uh, place with a manger, right? A barn or a cave or whatever it is, right? He's in this really raggedy room. And what were they supposed to do during the Feast of Tabernacles? 
They're supposed to dwell in booths. It's called the Feast of Booths in the Old Testament. They weren't allowed to sleep in their houses. They had to go out in the field, build a temporary structure to remind them of their place in Egypt. Why was Jesus in a booth? Why was Jesus in a barn? Oh, shut the door. Were you born in a barn? Where does that insult come from? My Savior was born in a barn. The King of the universe was born in a barn. Why was he born in a barn? Well, probably because he's born in Feast of Tabernacles and you're supposed to stay there for a week and he's keeping the law even the day he's born. Maybe, probably, very likely. So if you want to keep Christmas around Tabernacles, more power to you. If you want to keep it on December 25th, put up the lights and build the snowman and deck the boughs with halls of holly or whatever the thing is. Fill up your house with cinnamon sticks and, and cove leaves or what is that? Cloves. Whatever you want to do. You're not supposed to judge me and I'm not supposed to judge you whether it's Old Testament holidays whether it's some other culture that you were raised in in a different country, whether it's your American culture, none of those things are going contrary to Scripture according to Colossians 2.16. Enjoy the days that you choose to enjoy. Or of the new moons, that's, uh, that's having to do with the calendar. Some people make a big deal about the calendar because the Jewish calendar is different than ours. Or of the Sabbath days. Which day of the week between Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, which day of the week is the Sabbath day? It's Saturday. So no New Testament Christian is told to keep the Sabbath. And when Paul goes through all the Ten Commandments, he conveniently forgets to mention the Sabbath. In fact, he only mentions it here in Colossians 2.16. Don't worry about it. So the next question... What does Jesus say about the commandments, especially the commandment, Thou shalt work six days? In Exodus 20, verse 9, it says, Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. What are you supposed to do with the commands in the Old Testament, Thou shalt work six days and have a day of rest? I think it's a good example. It doesn't affect your spirituality one bit. I think it would be good for you to take one day off every week and not work. I mean by not working, not mentally working, and not physically working. I think that would be a great thing to do. Are you commanded to do it? Does it make you more spiritual? No. What does the Jesus say about the commandments? I'm glad you asked. Look at Luke 24. Luke 24. I had to chew on this one a little bit. What does Jesus say about the commandments after the resurrection? Do we need to be under the Levitical law? Well, we know the answer is no, but... I thought that was an interesting question. What does Jesus say about the Old Testament law after after he's resurrected? Well, it didn't take too long to read everything Jesus said after his resurrection. Last couple chapters of each gospel. Give you some a brief, some a longer account. Look at Luke 24. And I had a good verse to start with. Where did I make a note of that? 13. Luke 24. It says, And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score sixty furlongs. Anybody got a note how far that is? Seven and a half. Okay, furlong is a sixth of a mile, I think. So seven and a half, thirty sixty divided by whatever. Okay, that's too much math. So they they're just taking a walk, seven seven plus miles. Fourteen. They got enough time to get into a conversation. They talked together of all these things which had happened. Obviously, the crucifixion of Jesus had just happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. Wouldn't that be strange if Jesus came in the church service this morning, sat down next to you, and your eyes were holden that you couldn't know that he was there? Wouldn't that be a scary thing if the Lord was just right in your midst and he's working in somebody's heart over here and he's working in somebody's life over here and you're sitting there just cold to the whole thing? That'd be, that'd be a terrible thing. Jesus is getting in on their conversation because he wants to reveal out of their mouth some things that are in their heart. He said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And one of them whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, <laughs> Cleopas says, Are you the only guy around here that doesn't know what's going on? Have you been hiding under a rock? <laughs> Kinda. 
<laughs> Cleopas answered and said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? Verse 19, And he said unto them, What things? <laughs> Yeah, I had a, I found a quote in one of my books there that said, I find it strange how great a lack of humor is in the Bible. And I thought, what are they talking about? I sat down, I wrote that on the note cards so I could preach it later. I don't have it with me, but I just wrote down five things, the first things that came to mind in Genesis and went through and found a few more between God talking to Abraham and Jacob and behold, it was Leah and on down the list you go, and Joseph and Pharaoh talking together. There's, there is... <laughs> <laughs> There's fall out of your seat funny all through the Bible. Jesus, the creator of the universe, has been living under a rock for three days, and these guys say, are you the only guy that doesn't know what's going on? What, what go, What's going on? <laughs> Tell me about it. And they said unto him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, before God and all the people. Boy, I bet he was glad he said that after he found out it was Jesus. <laughs> that he's talking him up to him and didn't know it was him, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel, and beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher, and when they found not his body, they came, saying that they also had seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us, went to the sepulcher and found it, even so as the woman had said, but, oh man, but him they saw not. You can hear it in his voice. We trusted that it had been him. We thought it was him, but right now we're not sure. A bunch of women saw it, but they didn't find his body. Then they saw angels, but then they went back and his body still wasn't there. And Jesus says in verse 25, then said he unto them, O oh, fools, and slow of heart to believe what? All that the prophets have spoken. I think every preacher in the country should get together and preach that message to the congregation. Mm -hmm. Maybe start with preaching it to each other. Hey preachers, O oh, fools, to doubt the Word of God when it's plainly written in black and white in front of you. And you doubt it again and again and again. And you doubt it because you already have your Baptist mentality made up, or your American mentality made up, or your Republican mentality made up, or your super conservative, I'm not a Republican mentality made up, or whatever it is. And the scriptures come through every time, and they will never fit your socially acceptable mold. And Jesus says you're a fool to a guy that pretty much believed anything that the best Christian would have believed at that moment. And Jesus says, not good enough. You fools. Didn't you know that it was in the Old Testament that all these things were going to happen? To believe all that the prophets have spoken? How about Isaiah 53? He said he was going to be pierced and beaten and whipped and that they'd make furrows in his back in Isaiah 50 or 51 and that nobody would be able to recognize him. His visage would be marred more than any man. Did you guys miss that part? Because that was part of it. But all you believed was the positive, positive, positive. He's going to save us. He's going to destroy Rome and we're going to have the victory because he's the most powerful man in the universe. His ways are not our ways. His ways are his ways and his ways were not to take over the known world or the whole world at that time. Jesus says in verse 26, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? What does Jesus say about the Old Testament? Verse 27, after the resurrection. And beginning at Moses, there's the law, and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all the scriptures and the things concerning who? Himself. Himself. You know what would be a good application of the Old Testament for those of you maybe listening online or whoever? For those of you who want to hold to those Old Testament traditions, you know what an old, a good application would be? You should find how those Old Testament scriptures speak of Jesus Christ. You should find how those Old Testament scriptures show you that Abraham was a picture of God the Father and Isaac was a picture of God the Son and Eliezer was a picture of God the Holy Spirit. The Old Testament has the fingerprints of God like a vessel that's made by the potter all over its text. 
And you couldn't miss Jesus Christ in the New Testament having known about him in the church age. What does Jesus have to say about the Old Testament? He cares about the things of himself in the Old Testament. Not your feasts, those point to him. Not the garments that you wear, those point to him. Not keeping the priesthood and putting bread on the table of showbread, except as how they apply to himself. What does Jesus think about the Old Testament? That's what he thinks. He told you what he thinks. Don't be a fool. He told you what he thinks in Luke chapter 24. We don't have time to finish the story. It's a good story. All right, last question. How close do you think we are to the rapture? Turn to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 4. Preacher, you turn to these rapture verses all the time. I know, and every time I do, I give you something you haven't seen before. Say, so how do you know that? Because every time I turn to them, I see something I haven't seen before. 1 Thessalonians 4, you just keep looking at different ways, different ways, different ways. You, you learn a little bit more about it. The greatest event on the calendar for me was when Jesus Christ saved my soul. That's Calvary. The greatest event on the calendar for the Lord is the day he comes back and takes this earth that he made for himself and gets vengeance on the wicked, wickedness <laughs> in this world. That's the greatest day on his calendar. In between those two days is a date, uh, we don't know, a date of it's going to be called the rapture. Look in 1 Thessalonians 4, 1 Thessalonians 4, and it says in verse 14, If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, that's salvation, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him, whether you're alive or whether you're asleep. Verse 15, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. What is going to happen before the rapture? Well, that's easy. Number one, the Lord has to descend from heaven. He can't be raptured unless he descends from heaven. You see, the rapture could happen this second, only if he could do all these things in one second. And these are not one second things. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven. Number two, there's a shout. You have to hear a shout before there can be a rapture. You say, how much time? I don't know the time. I just know these, it takes time to, hey! It, that took some time, right? Whatever that was. <laughs> with the shout, number, what are we on? Three, with the voice of the archangel. That's something different. What does he have to say? Well, I don't know, but it takes longer than a second to say anything. He has something to talk about. Probably Gabriel, because he's got the gift. And then, with the trump of God... Now we got a shout, a voice, and a trump. He said, maybe all those are all the same thing. That is possible. There's a, some support for that. But these are four different things so far. And then number five, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Dead people had to come out of the ground. What is, what's the last word? First. Well, I don't know how long it takes for the ground to crack and crumble and gravestones to get tipped over and people to sit up and look at the rising sun because they're facing east in every graveyard, right? I don't know how long that takes, but I suppose it takes a couple seconds. It could take a little bit of time. But the dead in Christ shall rise first. How close do you think we are to the rapture? I'll have a lot better idea when I see the Lord come back down from heaven in a cloud. Then I'll have a lot better idea. <laughs> Verse 17 First word in the verse, then, then. There's a time element of things taking place here. We've brushed over it for 40 years in Baptist theology. There's some time happening here. It takes some time for these things to happen. Then we which are alive and remain, remain where? Remain here while the dead people already got caught up ahead of us. There's a time element. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. So they got there first, then we meet up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Last step is we meet the Lord in the air. The Lord's always having us fellowship with the saints before we get to meet him. You have a picture of it every Sunday. We come in the door, the Lord, you know... We hope he's here, right? We hope he meets with us. But what do we do first? We have coffee and we talk and how's your week going and what, you know, how many ducks did Eric shoot out of the sky or whatever it is. <laughs> we have that fellowship first and then we have, then we have the fellowship with the Lord that follows. And that's okay with the Lord.
Like he built it that way. Then shall we meet the Lord in the air. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We don't have time for chapter 5, but I want you to read chapter 5 when you have time. The first five verses of there, six or seven or eight verses, those are talking about the second advent. That's the end of the tribulation. This rapture in chapter 4 is pre-trib. Chapter 5 is post-trib. You make a note of that, study it on your own, and we'll have to expound on it another time because I'm trying to answer this rapture question. Turn to 2 Thessalonians 2. As soon as you study the rapture, you start getting it confused with the second advent, and then you get some information tangled. You get the two events combined, and you're going to have contradictions, and you're going to have information that's incorrect, applying the wrong event to the wrong time. So keep those two events separate, four and five, make a break in the events, and I'll have to teach on that another time. All right, look at chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, verse uh -huh. Verse 1, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Did we just read that? Caught up together with them? Okay, we have our context, rapture. That ye be not soon shaken in mind. Be not what? Yeah, the little word. Be not what? Soon. Everybody wants the rapture to happen in their lifetime. You say, what about you? Of course I want the rapture to happen in my lifetime just like they did in 1000 A.D. How could the Lord wait any longer than 1000 A.D.? Or 1666, or 666, and every other date in between. Soon shaken in mind. Your timing is not God's timing. Your timing is going to be wrong because you have a, a double agenda. You have a bias. You have an un, uh, hmm, lacking holiness bias. You're selfish. You want them to be back today or tomorrow or the next day that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. Well, why is he implying that somebody's going to be shaken or troubled? Because there's guys like Putin that walk on this earth. Hitler 2.0 is the title of <laughs> Brother Bartlow's letter. And I'm sorry, I forgot to print it out. Uh, why would you be shaken or troubled? Because it's going to get troublesome. Neither by spirit nor by word. Boy, we should stop on all these. we got to finish here, though. I'm not even to the part here. By spirit, really? <laughs> the spiritual influence, the spirit of this age, the spirit of Fox, CBS, CNN, ABC, NBC, MSNBC, whatever it is now. That spirit, the spirit of uh, Glenn Beck and the other two or three chumps on the t Christian, conser not Christian, but conservative talk radio, what do they do? They have a spirit. God hath not given us the spirit of fear. He gave that to Glenn Beck and Sean Hannity. And who's the big puffy-haired guy on Fox News? That guy. The, I'm, I'm everybody's father guy. Oh, who's the guy? Tucker Carlson. Come on. You guys know Tucker Carlson. I'm the fatherly, everybody's fatherly figure, and I have a pursed look on my lips every time I talk. Why? Because you have the spirit of fear. You're not supposed to be shaken by that. Nor by word nor by letter as from us. Who's the us? Look at First Thess Second Thessalonians 1.1. 1, 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus. That's the us. Paul didn't write this by himself. He wrote it with the help of a young preacher that he got some advice. What do you think I need to write? They're always getting shooken up, Paul. You've got to encourage them. <laughs> Timothy had some input somewhere in this letter, and so did Silas, Silvanus. Nor by letter as from us, as that. Now look at this next verse three words here, as that the day of Christ is at hand. The day of Christ in Scripture is a reference to the rapture. You already know the context from verse 1. The day of Christ is different than the day of the Lord. That's theology 101, or at least it should be, and isn't anywhere in Bible colleges I've heard about, but that's theology 101 in a couple Bible schools, that the day of Christ is the rapture, and it's at hand. It means it's available to be here. It's within reach, but it ain't here yet. The door's not open, but the door handle is in reach. Three, let no man deceive you by any means. Oh, boy, there's a lot of those means. For that day shall not come except. The day of Christ shall not come except what? Except some things have to happen. We've got to wrap it up here, but here's a couple things. Except there come a falling away first. Has that happened? Well, okay, let's take a vote. How many say yes? This is a Baptist church. We don't get to vote very much around here. How many say no? Okay, I say yes, it has happened. 
And I can say no. Why, yes. Well, look around. Look at the churches. They're apostate. They have fallen away from a standing position. Apostase, apostate, standing, and apo to fall away from. It's everywhere. Well, has it fallen away in America as bad as it fell away in Sodom and Gomorrah when God threw brimstone out of the sky? In Billings? All of them? The daughters couldn't find one man in the whole land to come in under them to be a marriage partner? All of them? That's not Billings. And to be honest with you, that's not even L.A. or Honolulu. There are still righteous people in those cities. More than ten. By Abraham's dickering process, right? So is there a falling away? Well, yeah, there's a falling away. But how many of you say no? Not to that extent. Is that fulfilled or not? I don't know to what extent God means that has to happen. And neither do you. Next. There has to be a falling away first. Question mark on the checkbox. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. How many believe that that man of sin has been revealed? How many say yes? Okay, I'm actually raising my hand. I do believe yes. How many say no? Now nobody's going to raise their hand. <laughs> it's going to be the same as the last question. First page of the epistle dedicatory from the King James translators written to the king about his Bible. Not every Bible has this, but... They said, This writing in defense of the truth hath given such a blow unto that man of sin as will not be healed. They knew who the man of sin was. Who was the man of sin in their day? Anybody know who opposed the printing of this book and sent men to blow up the parliament by the hand of a man named Guy Fox? The Pope. They were going to draw and quarter the priest in that town because the priest heard his confessional and the priest was in on it. And the priest got off because the Pope has his ways and his means to politically sway people getting drawn and quartered. They knew who the man of sin was. The man of sin has been revealed. He's the Pope. He's the Pope. <laughs> Kick me off Facebook, please. He's the Pope. He always has been the Pope. And if he's not the white Pope, he's the black Pope. If he's not one of those two, then it's somebody working directly for him, but it's probably just him. You say, that's the man of sin? Yeah, and when the Antichrist shows up, which is called never called that in Revelation, but when the man of sin or the son of perdition or the false prophet or the beast, whoever he is, when he shows up, he will have some connection to that system. You say, man, I have had a connection to that system. I know. And just like the people at the top have been involved in things that the people at the bottom know nothing about, it happens in every culture and in every corporation. Sometimes the wickedness happens at the top and the people at the bottom have no clue about it. Has the man of sin be re been revealed? He was revealed a long time ago. What's his name? Who's the beast's name today? I mean, point to him. Say it's Putin. You just have a bad emotion about Putin because of the news media. That's all that is. Because it couldn't have been anybody but Hitler. Oh, wait, it's not Hitler because that's a long time ago. Who's the man of sin? It's Mussolini. One preacher said, if Mussolini is not the Antichrist, I'll quit preaching. <laughs> he was so sure of it and so against it. And, he's, and he is such an Antichrist. He's absolutely an Antichrist. But he wasn't the one. You say, who's going to know? There was this man named John. Not John the Baptist, but John the Beloved. And he leaned on Jesus' breast one day. And Jesus said, uh, one of you is going to betray me. John had his ear right there on the heart of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me. And they all began to say, is it I, Lord? Is it I? Is it I? And I bet Judas kept his mouth shut. <laughs> I bet Judas was like, don't say it. Don't say anything to me. Don't say it. But one guy didn't say, is it I? It was John the Beloved leaning on his breast. And John the Beloved said, Lord, who is it? Who is John a picture of? John the Beloved. Don't you have a special love as the church that the world doesn't have? God so loved the world. That's a big, general, great love. But don't you have a specific love? Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You have a special love like John the Beloved who pictures the church. 
And John sat there next to Jesus Christ because he abode in him and was close to him and had fellowship with him and said, Lord, tell me who it is. And Jesus said, you're going to know as soon as I dip this sop, there's going to be another guy that dips his sop in the same dish at the same time. Jesus broke off a piece of bread. A couple other guys broke off a piece of bread, and John's watching the table, and Jesus reached forward, and Judas Iscariot reached forward, and they both dipped their sop into that little bowl, that little dish. I could prove to you that it was butter if we had time to run the references. Dipped the sop in the dish. And Jesus took a bite, looked at John, and that was it. He never said, it's Judas Iscariot. He didn't say that. What did he do? He gave him a sign based on some events. You say, who is it? You'll know who it is. Why? Because you're the church and you have that special privilege to lean against the Lord and say, Lord, who is it? And you know what you won't do when you find out? If you find out, you know what you won't do? You won't get on the internet and blog who it is. Because the guy that abides in Christ doesn't waste his time with that nonsense. Yeah. Amen, preacher. Amen, amen, amen. What's going to happen before the rapture? He'll be revealed. Has he been revealed? Could the rapture happen today? Absolutely. I could point to a place a little ways east of here and say, yep, that place is responsible for a lot of wickedness in this world, and that's a good enough revelation, but I think it's more specific. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all. Let's just wrap it up here. There's a lot more in there. There's a lot more in there. You say, Isaac, what is your opinion on the rapture related to current events in Scripture? I think there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, and there have been hundreds of them. And this little pop-up skirmish is nothing more than has already happened countless times over in history. I will not know based on Fox News. I will not know based on the blog that somebody follows or the Facebook feed that somebody crams down my throat. I won't know based on any of those things. I'll open up the Word of God one day, and the Lord's going to turn the light on, and I'll be in prayer, and the Lord's going to say, Get ready. And I'm going to hear a shout, and I'm going to say, did anybody else hear that? And then I am going to text some people. Anybody else hear that? <laughs> yeah, I heard a trumpet. JR, what key was that in? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say, let's hit the streets. Right? I know it's more spiritual to say I'd be hoeing my garden and planting potatoes, but I, I'm going to go make a Biggest fool out of myself ever on downtown 24th and King or by the, you know, the big tall building, the, the whatever, the city brew in the corner of that hotel, wherever it is. I mean, why not go out with a bang? Make a fool of yourself. You heard a shout. How many days you got? You know, like in the Bible, maybe 40 at the most, maybe 12 hours at the least, somewhere in between there. Go out with a pizzazz, man. Watch the people walk around and preach too. I mean, be among the zombies preaching, coming out of the graves. Let everybody else carve their wooden swords to defend against them, and then we're all going to be gone. It's going to be a whole waste of time anyway. The devil's got the whole psyche of the world's people prepared for this event that's in scripture and has dead people coming out of the ground why is the devil so fascinated with zombies why are you some of you so fascinated with zombies because the devil's got people deceived to have an imitation ready for when the real thing happens it's all over it's all over and when that happens i know it didn't happen in 1975 like my parents hoped it would i know it didn't happen in 89 <coughs> everything was in place in 89 it couldn't happen later than 1993 because you have a seven-year tribulation and it's got to be by the year 2000 is the end of it and so seven minus is 93 what are we still doing here couldn't possibly be later than 2000 i went to bible school in the year 2000 and my preacher said i cannot see from scripture how we are still standing here today <laughs> he was set ready for it to happen in his lifetime and he passed on and now somebody says it can't be any later than 2026. And somebody says it can't be any later than 2030. And 2033 sure would sound nice because Jesus was 33. And all the men of Christianity in the past went through this in the year 1000. They said it couldn't be later than 993. And it couldn't possibly be later than 1000. And then they had predictions about 1030 and 1033 in the dark ages because why they had a bible and they read their scriptures and they loved the lord's appearing and you know what happened when they got to heaven they got a crown of righteousness because they loved his appearing whether they saw it or not you say what's this war with ukraine 
um, in the bucket of drops of water, it's nothing. It's the vapor that's coming off the top. It's nothing. It's just another emotional thing. Haven't you figured it out in 40, 50, 60 years of being alive that this is always going to keep happening? Yeah. If they don't keep you distracted, they can't sell you zestfully clean on the commercial <laughs> in five minutes from now. It's not going to ever quit. Where are you going to find the answers? In a boring old black book that shines the light on everything going on in the world when you open it up. Lord, please bless the words of this book as we read them this week and spend time in them. Lord, ask help us stay close to you. Lord, you did say to ask that you'd come back. John said, even so, come, Lord, quickly. He asked that you come back quickly. Lord, ask that you please come back. And we want to see you, Lord. We want to see you come out of the clouds and make a mess of this country because we're just a little bit selfish and spiteful of where we live. But, Lord, we love you, and we want to see you return. We want to see some things straightened out, and we want to see the, the wicked stuff in this world come to an end. And, uh, Lord, you please uh, help us this week to love you, stay close to you, worry about what we need to do, not worry about what everybody else needs to do. I ask you, please guide us, lead us, guide us, help us to be listening, be sensitive to what you're working with in our lives. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Amen.